And of course, by, 17, by 1863, they were all freed. And it was a great compliment to the Muds that they have taken the name Mud. And I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't more black Muds in Washington, D.C. than they are white. Uh, the, only, the, uh, the only Mud to die uh, in the uh, Spanish-American War was a black man who came from uh, Maryland. And I even uh, I found the, the charge to the government for digging his grave, which was two dollars and a half. So, uh, uh, of course, many of the, of the uh, black people were afraid to answer my letters, but I was able to get a wonderful history of the black people of Maryland and Virginia, and uh, those who be interested will find it in my book. Now, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to even attempt to give you the uh, entire story of the Lincoln assassination because uh, uh, it, it is a very lengthy thing. And uh, I'm uh, going to watch my wristwatch very carefully so that I don't speak too long. But when the good pastor <coughs> of St. Teresa's was up here praying, I almost ready to ask him to pray that my projector will work. <laughs> I gave a talk a couple of days ago, and uh, to my great dismay, it blocked, and uh, I could not use it for the rest of the talk. Now, knowing my subject as well as I do, if this happens, don't feel sorry for me because I'll find a way <laughs> to continue my talk. <clears throat> but um, I, of course, feel very strongly that Dr. Mudd was innocent. And uh, <clears throat> I have tried for at least 50 years to have him exonerated. And uh, I doubt if this is ever going to happen. But uh, a wonderful thing happened here two days ago. and. Uh, it is something I hope the entire United States will notice. And that is the home of Mrs. Surratt was dedicated down at Clinton. Mrs. Surratt was just as innocent as my grandfather was. And uh, this home <coughs> is going to be a monument to injustice and discrimination. Discrimination because against Mrs. Surratt because she was a Catholic, and because she was a woman. And uh, I think that Dr. Mudd was discriminated against. I know that minority people are always worried that they're discriminated against. I think the Mudds have had their share of discrimina discrimination. There were, <coughs> there were three strikes against Dr. Mudd. <coughs> First of all, <coughs> because he was a slave owner. Secondly, uh, because he was a Catholic, and third, because he had the name of Mud. A guy with those three things is automatically guilty as soon as he comes in court. And uh, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the preamble that I would like to give you, but uh, uh, I would like to at least say that six states have passed resolutions asking the president to exonerate Dr. Mudd. And Maryland was the first. <clears throat> it was Maryland and Michigan, Oklahoma, Massachusetts, Florida, and Oregon. And there are about, oh, maybe 10 states that are in the process of passing resolutions to ask the president to exonerate Dr. Mudd. <clears throat> but even though Mr. Ford comes from Michigan, it doesn't help me any. Um, the office of the president says that a man can't be exonerated after he's dead. And unfortunately, Dr. Mudd is definitely dead. So um, I'm uh, hoping now that my projector will work. And uh, <clears throat> if it does, we're going to thank uh, uh, Father here for his prayers, his secret prayers. We also have Sister Louise here from Springfield, Virginia, an excellent historian. Sister Louise, would you stand up? <clears throat> and also Sister Mary over here, someplace hidden. 
whom I, I believe you all probably know her. And uh, <coughs> I think if I can get uh, Father and the two nuns to keep praying now, that our, my projector will work. We'll turn it on. <coughs> and then General Grant came to Washington, and the president thought that it would be good, good publicity for him to be seen <coughs> with General Grant in public. And uh, although the next day was Good Friday, they decided that they would go to a show. And uh, <coughs> they were going to go to, Fort, to the Ford Theater. This is a picture of Ford's theater as it was at the time of the Lincoln assassination. <coughs> you can see there, number one was the entrance to the gallery. Number two is where the president and Mrs. Lincoln entered. And uh, number three, and four were open in mild weather, but were not used in April. <coughs> John Wilkes Booth's original plan was to kidnap Lincoln. He had no desire to assassinate him because he wanted to take Lincoln in the South and to tell the North, we have your president, give us a hundred or give us uh, several thousand prisoners and you can have your president back. But with the war practically over, he uh, decided when he learned that Lincoln was going to go to the theater that Good Friday night that he would assassinate him. So he went into the theater and he bored a hole through the door to box number seven and uh, so that he could see the president. <coughs> I thought she was going to fail there. This was the show that night, Laura Keene in uh, Our American Cousin. Laura Keene was said to be one of the more attractive actresses of the Civil War period. And I will have to leave that up to the ladies to decide about that. <coughs> I have assigned autograph, autograph program of Laura Keene's. <clears throat> the president took his seat in box number seven here, and Mrs. Lincoln here, Major Rathbone, and Clara Harris here. Now, a man by the name of Parker uh, was engaged by Mrs. Lincoln to protect the president, and he was supposed to stand here. Now, I'm sure you will be surprised that the a wife of a president should have to engage somebody to protect her husband. <clears throat> but this was necessary because <clears throat> Secretary Stanton certainly did not give the president any protection. This is how the theater looks today, and I think it would be wonderful if you would have <clears throat> one of your meetings there. Um, again, Parker was supposed to stand here and keep everyone out, but he left his post and went down into one of the better seats, or he went out to get a, a, a drink. Now, none of these other boxes were sold, and uh, historians have wrestled with this problem, and they do not know just why the other six boxes were not sold. The president took his seat here in the rocker, which incidentally is in Greenfield Village in Michigan, and Mrs. Lincoln sat here. This is the door to box number seven, the door through, uh, through which Booth bored the hole. He looked through that hole, and he was afraid if he opened the door, he would hit uh, Lincoln's rocker. So he came through the door to box number eight, <clears throat> and this is the uh, rocker that Lincoln sat in. If you go to the museum there in Michigan, they will tell you 
that there is blood of Lincoln on the rocker, but that is not true, because Lincoln's wound did not bleed. The president had <clears throat> great difficulty getting anyone to go with him that night. First of all, because it was uh, Good Friday. Secondly, because Lee had surrendered to Grant only five days before. And thirdly, because uh, Stanton had advised the president not to go, it is said, and uh, they didn't want to hurt Stanton's feelings. But Major Rathbone decided that he would go with the president, and he took his fiancée, Clara Harris. Now, almost everyone who had anything to do with the Lincoln assassination had something terrible happen to them. In this case, Major Rathbone married Clara Harris. Now, I don't mean to say that marriage, <laughs> that marriage is something, something terrible. It certainly hasn't been for me, and I can say that publicly. Rose, are you listening? <laughs> but uh, he murdered her and then tried to commit suicide and died in an insane asylum in uh, Germany. Now, okay, I got some more. Um, the um, couple of days ago when I was giving a talk to a school in Charles County, the, uh, <clears throat> I showed the uh, slide of, of this spur which was the correct one. And I purposely took it out because that particular slide uh, caused my projector to fail. Now this spur is in the museum at Annapolis. And I'm almost positive it is not in the spur worn by Booth. But if Booth hadn't worn a spur, <coughs> I wouldn't be here telling the, giving you the talk, because if he hadn't worn the spur, he wouldn't have caught his foot. If he hadn't caught his foot, he wouldn't have broken his leg. If he hadn't broken his leg, he wouldn't have to go to my grandfather for treatment. This is the spot where he caught his um, foot in the treasury flag. The history books will say that it's the American flag, but it wasn't. <clears throat> Somebody is really praying back there. <laughs> and uh, this is the Derringer that uh, killed Lincoln, and a pistol ball that went through Lincoln's head, fragments of Lincoln's skull, and a, a probe that one of the doctors used that probably only uh, heard um, Lincoln to eternity. Wasn't very good medical treatment. He might have had a malpractice suit. Uh, <coughs> Booth came through box number seven, took plenty of time, fired into Lincoln's head just above the left ear. Now, he went awfully close to Major Rathbone, and the only explanation I can make for him, Major Rathbone not stopping them is that Major Rathbone was probably holding Clara Harris's hand and not paying any attention to the president. You will note that Booth also carried a dagger. In case the gun went off, uh, he would stab Lincoln through the heart. He dropped his pistol on the floor of the box and then ran to what they call then the balustrade uh, and jumped over onto the stage. This was a jump of about 14 feet it wasn't too much for Booth because he was a great actor and accustomed to uh, 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 jumping. But it is said that his left leg curled under him and he tore the carpet. He then ran to the middle of the stage and uh, he yelled the words which are the motto of the state of Virginia, Sic Semper Tyrannis, which means uh, thus to all tyrants. He then ran out through the left side of the stage, stabbing at everyone as he went out. Now at this point, Ed Spangler was accused of helping Booth get out of the theater, and he was tried and was given six years in prison.
this is how it, this is the deathbed scene of Lincoln. We won't take time to go into this. It's a long story. This is how that home looks today. This is a home of John Wilkes Booth at Bel Air, Maryland. Uh, he was not born in this home. He was three years of age <coughs> when he began to live there. Um, Lincoln uh, Booth never married, but he has a, a lot of descendants, and uh, which are shown here, and even my projector, my pointer doesn't want to work. Uh, and uh, many of these people are well-known actresses and actresses. I made a, a lengthy study of John Wilkes Booth's girlfriends, hoping that I would find out something about the Lincoln assassination. I found out a lot about human nature, but I didn't learn too much about the Lincoln assassination. This first girl up here, he, he had uh, two children by her and many descendants. The second one became the most famous madam of Birmingham, Alabama. She corresponded with Booth after Booth died, which is rather difficult. <laughs> and Booth corresponded back, and she published some of his, um, some of the correspondence. The other, these other uh, girls, uh, Booth had the pictures of most of them, uh, of 9, 10, 11, and 12 in his pocket at the time he was caught. John Wilkes Booth was a famous actor, and as I said, his original plan was to kidnap Lincoln, and, uh, but he decided to kill him. We do not know why he decided to assassinate Lincoln. That's a whole talk in itself. <clears throat> John Wilkes Booth's uh, father was Junius Brutus Booth. Uh, now it begins to work. Uh, who was born in England. He married Ad Adelaide Delanoy, and he had two children by her. Move the, that over a little bit, will you, sister, please? The, um, that's it. And uh, he uh, became tired of Adelaide, which is not unusual. And he came to the United States with a flower girl, which is a very good modern concept. <laughs> and he had 10 children by Mary Ann Holmes. <coughs> well, now, uh, his, his wife began to wonder in England what her husband was doing over here. So she came over and found out, and she did a very magnanimous and noble thing. She gave the um, uh, Junius Brutus Booth a divorce, and he married the mother, the mother of his ten children on John Wilkes Booth's 13th birthday. <coughs> Now, the, the father was very much like the son, or the son was very much like the father, and my son-in-law here located this for me, which you can read yourself. This was the first time, as far as I know, that a present was ever, ever threatened. <coughs> and I might say, because I might forget, might forget it, that um, in the four assassinations of presidents and the six attempted assassinations of presidents, no black man's ever been involved. I think you can be very proud of that. Uh, Junius Brutus Booth, the father, was a famous actor. He was also a chronic alcoholic. And when he went on the stage, he had to have his liquor. And when he couldn't get it by the glass, he'd have somebody pass it through a keyhole so that uh, he could be intoxicated when he went on the stage. I should tell you that it had to use a straw through the keyhole so that you could get the liquor, and that is correct. <laughs> These are some of the scratchings of John Wilkes Booth at the home in Bel Air. <clears throat> this is uh, his room, the exit from his room. This is the balcony where he practiced his Shakespearean lines, and there I am standing up there. Uh, Booth came out of the, out of the door, uh, which is sealed up here. He went down through Washington in the way shown here, F Street, 9th Street, Pennsylvania Avenue, around the Capitol, uh, Virginia Avenue, 11th Street. He crossed uh, the Anacostia River. <laughs> 
and then he went down uh, Good Hope Road, which was known as Harrison Street, and then Alabama Avenue, and then Branch Avenue. <coughs> and this is how the Eastern Branch uh, Bridge, which was also known as the Uniontown Bridge, and later the 11th Street Bridge, looked in 1865. <coughs> Incidentally, everybody tells me I should get a different projector and all that, but my problem is this, that a good third of my slides are glass slides, and uh, the ordinary projector uh, will only take the paper slides, so I have to depend on a projector of this type. This is how the 11th Street Bridge looks today. He passed uh, down uh, Harrison Street, which was Good Oak Road, and he passed the home of my, uh, the later home of my father, uh, which um, is uh, <clears throat> a second house from the corner from uh, uh, 14th Street in Anacostia. I was born there on the second floor on January the 24th, 1901. The next, well, this is the route that Booth took to Surrattsville, where we dedicated the home yesterday. The uh, correct name of it is Clinton to TV. And you'll notice that he went off of his route several miles to get to the uh, home of my grandfather. Uh, and uh, if, he had, if he did not break his leg, and if he did not have to spend time going to a doctor, he would have been in Virginia that night and would have been well on his way to Mexico, where we think uh, his destination was. Then he reached the home of Samuel Cox, and then he crossed the, the river on April the 21st. Uh, this is the marker in front of the Surratt home as it was six or seven or more years ago. And uh, two of uh, my grandchildren, uh, the McHales, the mother and father, are here today. And this is the home that was uh, dedicated uh, on Tuesday. This is how the home looked uh, six or eight years ago. Uh, there was a bar on one side and a post office on the other. And this is how the home looks as of day before yesterday. Uh, it has uh, uh, been painted and uh, has the appearance that it supposedly had in 1865. But on the day we went into the house, this is how the so-called parlor was. And I hope this gentleman isn't in the audience, but there's no reflection on him. He was running the place, and he said he wasn't going to try to fix it up. This little girl cried constantly and uh, until we gave her three quarters and then she stopped crying. That's the way you have to treat the women. <laughs> Only it's got to give more than quarters. Uh, Booth did not get off of his horse because uh, his leg was now beginning to give him trouble. This was two hours after the assassination. Harold did come into the house and he went through this door and went up these, these stairs uh, to get the items which had been stored there by John Surratt, the son of Mrs. Surratt. Uh, I'm sure Mrs. Surratt had nothing to do with the Lincoln assassination. I have a feeling that she knew that they were planning to kidnap uh, Lincoln, but the kidnapping of Lincoln was more or less of a military project. Then. Uh, <clears throat> upstairs in the rear room is the spot where it is believed that Booth hid his uh, uh, gun, his pistols, uh, candle, compass, and so forth. And on this occasion, it was very easy to lift up the boards. I was up in this room two days ago, and I was very much pleased to see that they have not nailed these boards down. Mrs. Surratt came through this door in order to get the, um, the rent because she did not like the idea of, go of a bar in the front of the house. She was a very unusual Christian woman, uh, extremely moral person, and uh, she did not like uh, uh, liquor, she did not like bars. The next place that Booth passed was a little town of TV. Uh, which is shown here as it was in the in the late 1800s, 
and uh, one of the few buildings left <coughs> is this little antique shop, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Now, if you uh, make a trip down there someday, it isn't very far away, and ask the man if he knows anything about the Booth story, he'll probably tell you that he doesn't know anything about it. But uh, Booth went down this road here, but you can't do that anymore. You have to come out and go down um, route, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it's 5 or 301. It's both of them, I guess. 5. 5. five. Well, then he entered uh, uh, Charles County, and he went across the, the country in this direction on the Matawoman Bean Town Road. One of the first places he passed was St. Peter's Church. And the reason I show the St. Peter's Church is this is the spot where the next day after Dr. Mudd set Booth's leg, he told his cousin, Dr. George D. Mudd, to go back to town and tell the troops that he had two suspicious people at his home. Now the pastor of St. Peter's caused this building to be torn down a couple of years ago and a new church has been built. I was very sad to see this. I thought that this historic structure should have been saved for an assembly building of some sort. The next place that Booth passed was the little St. Peter's Cemetery where the Muds uh, are buried. Now in this same plot is the uh, burial site of Ed Spangler, one of the eight men who was tried for the Lincoln assassination. Ed Spangler taught Dr. Mudd to be a carpenter in prison. And when he was released, he had no place to go. He was quite ill. And he came to Dr. Mudd's home, and he lived with him. But he died of tuberculosis. And of course, uh, Dr. Mudd, like every other good Catholic, converted into the Catholic religion. He was a Lutheran. And he was buried in the Catholic cemetery. I've been trying to get the Historical Society to put up a marker for 40 years, but they haven't done it. This is a picture of Ed Spangler. If you read the book, you'll get the impression that he's a very ignorant sort of a person. But he comes from one of the, the finest uh, German families, and there's a genealogy of his family, which is about four inches thick. Uh, I won't bother you with this because you can't see it, but this is the route that Booth took, came down the Matter Woman Road, and uh, passed St. Peter's Church, the cemetery, Dr. Mudd's home, and then left in this direction. Now, Dr. Mudd, uh, after he set Booth's leg that morning, went into Bryantown here, and he learned of the Lincoln assassination. Mm -hmm. And before I take this off, I will show you that here is St. Mary's Church in Bryantown. And unfortunately, Booth came there in October 1864, <coughs> and Dr. Mudd met Booth there after Mass, and uh, Booth wanted to buy a horse, and Dr. Mudd happened to say that his neighbor had a one-eyed horse that he wanted to sell. And Booth came back to Dr. Mudd's home that afternoon, and Dr. Mudd took him over to this house right here, uh, where George Gardner lived, and Booth bought the horse. This horse was used by one of, by um, Lewis Payne, who tried to assassinate Secretary Seward. This was the gate leading to Dr. Mudd's home, as it was in the, uh, in the late 1800s. This is how the entrance looks today. My grandmother uh, was three or four years younger than my grandfather. She was a Dyer, E-Y-E-R. My middle name is Dyer. She had a rather miserable existence while her husband was in prison. They placed troops on the farm, uh, and the troops shot up the chickens, broke down the the meat uh, barn, the meat crib, uh, broke down the fences and let the cattle roam. Now, uh, of course, she and her husband, my grandfather, had slaves until 1863. But she hired the slaves back, but she couldn't afford to pay wages. So she had a very miserable time. There was no aid to dependent children or welfare or social welfare, and she had to depend on the family. This is a marker in front of my grandfather's home. Incidentally, at the Surratt, 
a dedication, Mr. Goldstein, the Comptroller for the State of Maryland, announced that the state had uh, appropriated $91,000 to buy the Dr. Sam Mudd home and uh, 10 acres. He didn't mention 10 acres, but I know it was 10 acres. So that home will be dedicated uh, possibly sometime next year. Press that button. the next day, 
into Virginia, went to the home of Mrs. Cuisenberry. She didn't give him very much help, but uh, she found somebody to give them a horse and a wagon, and they continued on their route. They first went to the home of Dr. Stewart, and uh, he refused to redress Booth's leg, but he did uh, give him a little bit of help, and Booth gave him five dollars. Dr. Stewart let, let Booth and Harold sleep in the Lucas cabin on his property. This is Dr. Stewart's home, as it is today. And this is the Lucas cabin. <clears throat> now these, these poor people could have been held as accomplices for helping Booth to escape because they permitted Booth and Harold to sleep on the floor of their cabin. I suppose somebody paid them a few bucks to do it. I don't know. But anyhow, here was a great man great actor, John Wilkes Booth, and uh, earned $30,000 a year, maybe. And this is the only place that he could find to rest his head on that night, of April the 22nd. <clears throat> they then crossed the Rappahannock River, and they reached the home of Dr. Stewart, which is two miles from this marker. No, not Dr. Stewart, but uh, uh, Garrett. This is uh, <clears throat> the officer who was in charge of 25 troops who came down from um, Washington, D.C., and went all the way to Bowling Green, 13 miles further, <clears throat> and uh, found out that Booth and Harold were at the Garrett home. They came back to the Garrett home, uh, and the, the Garretts let Booth and Harold sleep in the house the first night, but the second night they made them sleep in the barn. Boston Corbett stood here, and uh, he thought, uh, Booth was going to shoot somebody, so he shot, he said to have shot Booth, he was paid about $1,500 for doing it, but actually all the historians feel that Booth shot himself. <coughs> Booth's body was dragged to number six there, um, placed in a knapsack, and taken back to Washington, and they did an autopsy on Booth, but they didn't take Booth's clothes off to do the autopsy, <laughs> which is a very difficult thing. <laughs> However, they cut his neck out, and his neck is preserved in uh, some kind of plastic at the Army Medical, the, uh, the Military Medical Museum, someplace here in Washington. Now, the doctor who did the autopsy gave a talk, and he described Booth's right broken leg. Well, Dr. Mudd said a left broken leg. So this led a lot of people to believe that Booth was never caught. And uh, this man in Glencoe, Minnesota, wrote to me in 1959, and you can see, he says, I still own the body of Wilkes Booth. It has never been buried. There are others uh, who tried to get it so far. I loaned it out to somebody, and I want to get it back so I can bury Booth. <laughs> now, there have been all sorts of books written on this subject. Now, this is, J this is Jay Gould on the left, and uh, I don't know exactly how it happened, but the man on the right, is Jesse James III. This is the, uh, the main book uh, on the subject of the escape of John Wilkes Booth uh, and his death in Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, when this man died in Enid, Oklahoma, they, um, uh, he had claimed he was Booth, so the undertaker kept the body and he sold the body to a, a circus. And uh, they put clothes on him and sat him up in the chair, and this is how he, a dead man looks sitting up in the chair. And if you can take the next slide, this is the mummy of John Wilkes Booth, uh, about uh, maybe 1905 or 6, and uh, John Wilkes Booth has never been buried, according to these people. Uh, this whole thing is covered in a book by Curtis McDougall uh, entitled The Hoaxes. Uh, the, the, one of the main books on the Booths of Maryland is uh, this book by uh, Stanley Kimball. Now, I'm going to begin to close out my talk here because I'm not, I'm not going to uh, burden you with the assassination except assassination trial <coughs> because it is too big a subject. Uh, this is the headgear that Dr. Mudd had to wear while he was a, a prisoner at Fort McNair and the old Capitol prison, and you can see there there's a slit through which they fed, fed him. And this is the headpiece. 
Now all of these people hadn't worried except Mrs. Surratt, and I think they were very, very kind and generous not to make Mrs. Surratt wear the head piece. <coughs> we could easily be in trouble again. <coughs> Thank you. 